be welcoming everyone to today's lecture. Um, we're joined by Dr. Rosemary Hill, who's going to be talking to us shortly about Pugin, or specifically about um, Romantics, Catholics and Millenarians, Pugin and the Victorian Church. So I'm really excited about today's lecture. Um, I've read um, one of Dr. Hill's books and I've got her latest one, which is on my pile of books to get through. But as is always, the first 10 minutes of these lectures is dedicated to Church of the Week, where we talk to you about Pacific Church in our care, which hopefully in some way has a link to today's lecture. And I think we've got a real treat in store for you today. So without any further delay, I'm going to pass you to our Chief Executive, Peter Rez, who's going to tell you about this week's Church of the Week. Thank you very much, George, and hello, everybody, and uh, really good to see you. I'm very excited today about today's uh, lecture, which I'll tell you about in uh, a little while. But first of all, let me go through the usual rigmarole of trying to get my screen to share so I can share with you uh, Church of the Week this week. And we, what a fantastic church we have for you today. But before we start, I'd really like to thank Ecclesiastical, who sponsor Church of the Week and also support our lunchtime lectures. So today's church is a church I know very well, and you may know very well too, which is St Peter's and St Paul's in Albury in Surrey. Now I've got to work out how to move the slide on. There we go. Um, the Church of St Peter and St Paul is known locally as the Saxon Church, which distinguishes it from the parish church in the village, and it dates from the period just prior to the Norman Conquest. Saxon work can still be seen in the walls of the nave and tower, and almost the whole church retains its medieval structure. The church is entered through a late medieval porch, which you can see pictured here, and uh, although, the door, although this door was inserted into the Saxon walls in the mid-13th century, the tower was, was the chancel of the original Saxon church and the lower levels of predominantly of that date, although its pretty wooden cupola is of early 19th century date. The tower contains one bell hung here by the Friends of Albury Church in 2008. The original bells had been moved to the new church in the village in 1841. The nave and south aisle date from about uh, AD 1300, although the north and west walls of the nave are predominantly of Saxon masonry. You can see these in the left-hand photograph. On the right is the chancel. The chancel was without a roof for a hundred years and the present roof was constructed in the late 20th century by the Church's Conservation Trust, I believe. In front of the altar is a ledger slab commemorating Henry Wicks. Born in 1580, he became paymaster in the Office of Works, working for the Crown with such illustrious men as Inigo Jones. Two interesting features to look out for when you visit this church can be seen here. The first remains is the remains of the font base, suggested by some to be salvaged stone from a Roman temple on Farley Heath, has lost its bowl, which was, was moved to the new church in 1841. You can see a theme developing here with things being pilfered into the other church. The second feature to look at is something they managed to hold on to, which is a brass commemorating John Weston. The inscription in Latin translates as, here lies John Weston Knight, who died 23rd of November, Anno Domini 1440, on whose soul may God have mercy. High on the south wall is an opposing 15th century wall painting of St Christopher carrying the Christ child. It faces the north door, as medieval belief said that if you saw an image of this saint in the morning, you would have a safe day. On your way to work, you would have looked through the north door and glimpsed the image. The Drummond Chapel is, for many, the highlight of a visit here, due to the fragile, as for many, a highlight of the visit here, but due to the fragile of nature of the decoration, it is not normally possible to enter, although you can see most of it very clearly through the screens. It was this 13th century south transept that Henry Drummond chose to refurbish as his family mausoleum. At the time, Pugin was employed to decorate this chapel. He had already had a prodigious output in his eight year career and his reputation was high. Here he designed an image niece, niche, an altar tomb on the south wall, memorials for Drummond and his family and the wall stenciling and stained glass. You'll be hearing more about this chapel from, from our speaker today, Dr. Rosemary Hill. And the Drummonds are now, I think, were part of the Royal Bank of Scotland in the end as well. So uh, there's a long sort of heritage, uh, which hopefully uh, would pay dividends. Finally, what you see here is many of our churches are, are, are chosen to feature on the silver screen. And Albury, I'm pleased to say, has, a, has been a couple of blockbusters. Here you can see the 2018 film Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, which is a fantastic movie and 
Uh, you may also be aware of a more famous film, if you're old enough, uh, the 1994 classic Four Weddings and a Funeral, where Aubrey plays the role of a Perthshire church for wedding number three, which we're, we're pleased to say. So I think a very fitting Church of the Week this week. Um, I'll just stop sharing my screen. Um, and uh, over to you, George. Thanks, Peter. So everyone, that was St. Peter and St. Paul Albury um, in Surrey. So if you'd like to go and visit it, um, we really recommend that you do put it on your church crawling list because it is a spectacular, uh, spectacular church. So um, do make sure um, that is on your um, to visit list. Now, um, we've got time for a few questions to ask Peter. So if you've got any questions, um, please comment away and um, we'll put them to Peter now. Um, Peter, our final slide talked about um, filming in churches. Um, Going forward, some people might think there's a bit of a conflict of interest with using these spaces for commercial purposes and particularly with filming. Um, how do we balance sort of protecting the fabric of these and buildings in a sacred space with filming? Huh. Well, it's a good question. Um, first of all, one needs a huge quantity of cash to keep these buildings upright and to keep them well maintained. And uh, the best way of raising such money is a mixed economy, which is uh, some philanthropy, uh, some support from the state uh, and statutory funding and some support from whatever commercial ventures we can undertake. Now, at the Trust, we have several sources of commercial interest, which helps sort of maintain our sustainability and filming is but one. The others are sort of, uh, we do consultancy work, we have a maintenance business, and we also have Champing, if you've not come across this, champing.co.uk. Uh, you can still get and book uh, your breakaway. There's not many places to go on holiday this year, but I'm sure Champing can accommodate you, staying in a beautiful historic church. Um, but filming, back to filming, filming's really, really important because it does several things for us, and we take huge care over the content of the filming and to checking the scripts, to seeing what the, what the film's all about, but also over the fabric of the buildings while these, build, these, these filming uh, events take place. Because you can see there's a lot of kit that's involved in making movies and we're very concerned about the fabric of the building themselves. But not only do they provide a good revenue, and um, uh, I must say that sort of Hollywood movies and the sort of growth of Netflix and, uh, you know, big budget movies, they can be very lucrative for the, the buildings themselves and can make a huge difference to, to our income. Um, and I think they're a vital part of what we do for the future. And our churches also come with the added advantage that they don't have a weekly service in them generally. So you can uh, use those really well. And we've got a wide variety of different churches and different things for people to use. So um, uh, I'm all for filming and uh, we're working really hard in generating uh, better links with the industry itself to, to make sure that we can do it more frequently. But also when you get a great film, people will go and visit the uh, location that that film was filmed in as well. So we get more visitors as a result and it reaches a wider audience. So everyone's a winner. Thanks, Peter. And yeah, um, we've got a couple of other churches that have been used for films, everyone. So what we'll do is um, we'll try and put a blog together where you can find out um, about different locations that have been in some really impressive either TV shows or um, Hollywood blockbusters. Um, Peter, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, someone's asked here, um, with lockdown restrictions easing, um, starting to ease and we're looking, people can go and visit churches. Are our churches available um, for community uses? Um, our churches are the original community use building. Uh, so yes, yes, very much so. Uh, it's, uh, if, uh, it depends what you want to do. So visiting, they're open for, if you want to run events, do go to our website where you can get in touch with the teams uh, in relation to the particular buildings, if you wish to hire them. And local groups have been starting to do this. We've been uh, having a big campaign to try and um, get local communities to use these buildings for events again at the moment, because it's really important that everyone gets out there. Uh, but there are certain uh, uh, you know, rules to follow it to give everyone confidence. Now, some people are much more confident than others, and there's a real mixed bag of how people feel about the world opening up again. And uh, our advice is all about making people feel as comfortable as possible in these spaces. So uh, get out and visit, and uh, hopefully we'll also see lots of community events the week before last. Was it last week? I went to see um, The Tempest by uh, This Is My Theatre at uh, St Peter's, Northampton. We were out in the churchyard. It was perfectly safe and it was a fantastic evening. So there are lots of those theatre events going on in our churches as well. So please do support them too. 
Thanks, Peter. And as Peter said, everyone, um, if you're interested in using one of our churches for community event or for a private hire event that you'd like to possibly hold up, hold, host one of our churches, you can find details of how to do that on our website, which is visitchurches.org.uk. Now, um, we're about to start the lecture, everyone. So a warm welcome to everyone. Um, thanks to everyone who's telling us where you're watching from. So if, you, if this is your first time, please do say a special hello and let us know where you're watching from. I see um, it's great to see people um, from all over the country and indeed from right across the world joining us today. So warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Now, this lecture is completely free of charge. Um, if you see anyone commenting with any links telling you to watch elsewhere, please don't click those links. You can only watch it live on our Facebook page at the moment. Um, the lecture is recorded, so if you need to go away and want to um, catch up on it, don't worry, um, it has been recorded. That'll be available on our Facebook playlist, but also on our YouTube channel. Again, completely free of charge to watch. Um, as we said um, during Church of the Week, um, today we are joined by Dr. Rosemary Hill, who's going to be talking to us about um, Kugin, um and um, sort of um, his life, um, his admiration of sacred architecture and some of the churches that he built during his um, remarkable lifetime. Um, to coincide with today's lecture, we've, um, we're selling two books. Um, so some of you may know, um, Rosemary wrote the very first modern biography, and indeed it, it really is a landmark publication for learning about Pugin um, and his remarkable um, accomplishment during his lifetime. Um, we're selling this book, but we're also selling Rosemary's brand new book, Time's Witness, which um, Rosemary sent me, she only officially launched this week. Um, so it's hot off the printing press. Um, both of these we are selling at a discounted price um, individually um, but if you wanted to buy both of them I'm just going to get it so I've got the right figures in front of me everyone so if you wanted to buy both of these um, in a high street shop your RRP for both titles together would be $45.99 we're selling both of them together at a special price of just $33.99 plus postage and packaging so that's a really brilliant saving um, and by buying with us um, the profits go to helping conserve fantastic and historic churches such as the chapel Drummond Chapel at Oldbury. Um, so if you'd like to buy any books from us today, um, we'll post a link um, below shortly. Now, finally, if you'd like to become a member with us, um, and membership starts from just £3.50 a month, um, we're running a special offer at the moment. So if you join us by direct debit and use the offer code LECTURE, and that's the word LECTURE in capitals on our website, you'll be sent a free copy of this. Um, and this is the secret language churches and cathedrals decoding the sacred symbolism of Christianity's holy buildings. And it's a great accompany, um, accompanying book to all of our lectures. It expands all the different topics that we've covered um, so far. And also it talks about some of the ones that we've got planned for later on this year and also early next year, you'll be pleased to know. Um, we're taking brand new receipts of these. Um, they've just been reprinted and we've got an exclusive print run which will be delivered hopefully next week. Um, so by either by the end of this month or by um, the start of August, you will get your free copy of this. But that's only available if you um, join as a member by direct debit and use that off code lecture. If you've got any technical questions, um, have any problems, come to way. Um, one of the great things about these lectures is that there is plenty of time at the end to ask our lecturer your questions. So if you've got a question, please do comment away on Facebook and um, we'll do our best to put it to Rosemary at the end. If you're watching on Catch Up, either on YouTube or on Facebook, please do keep your questions coming because we do monitor them and we'll try and get you responses to your questions. But again, welcome everyone. It's great to be um, joining you all again today. I'm going to pass you back to Peter, who's going to introduce today's lecture. Thank you, George. And please do consider joining the Church's Conservation Trust. Not only do you get a, a free book with your membership, but you get to join us and you get to be part of our mission to help save these fantastic buildings into, into the future. And any contribution you can make to support us would be really, really welcome. Uh, there's an ongoing issue about how we fund these buildings. They always need money to maintain them and repair them uh, because they have gravity pulling them down. So your support is really, really appreciated and very, very welcome. You can see in the chat how to uh, go about um, joining and the special offers that we've got in advance. Now, I'm hugely excited today to welcome Rosemary Hill to lecture for us today. And I'll tell you why in a minute, because there's a personal story that needs putting right today as well, So, uh, which is really important. So Rosemary's a writer, a historian and an independent scholar with an interest in biography, material culture 
and the connection between those things. She, as George says, has written two prize winning books, uh, God's Architect, A Life of the Gothic Revival Architect, A.W.N. Pugin. And it says in my notes, it says a life of the Gothic revival architect, A.W.N. Pugin and Stonehenge, which would have been a really interesting book. But I think that's a separate book. Uh, maybe that's the sequel to the other. Stonehenge, a history of one of Britain's greatest and least understood monuments, which I would kind of agree with. Uh, her last book, Unicorn, the Poetry of Angela Carter, was published in 2015. And as you've heard, uh, just half the press and recently launched, we've got her next book, Time's Witness, How Romanticism Changed History and will be published now, as we know, by Elaine, and you can get hold of your copy um, from us. Um, Rosemary is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and the Society of Antiquaries, and a member of English Heritage's Blue Plaques panel, a trustee of the Pugin Society, and a Quandam Fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, uh, which is great. So uh, the thing is that's very personal about this today and why I'm so pleased is uh, I actually bought, a, when it was published, God's Architect, this book, and I really, really enjoyed it and was looking forward to reading it again because it takes a while for things to fix into it. And I lent it to somebody and you know, they never gave it me back. And so they, if they're out there, if you're out there today, you know who you are. I'd like my book back, please. That would be very great. But it's a wonderful thing to have Rosemary with us today. I, I think you're gonna really enjoy this lecture and we're very blessed to. Uh, Rosemary, thank you for giving your time for free to support the work of the Church's Conservation Trust. And over to you, thank you. Well, not at all. Thank you for asking me. Um, it's a cause very close to my heart. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And I'm also going to just move myself and the rest of us down out of sight. I'll come back at the end for the questions, but I don't think there's oops, all that much to be gained by just seeing my head going up and down. Can I make us any smaller than that? Yes. I can. Right. Um, so Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin, 1812 to 1852, and he presents the biographer with a curious set of problems. Because on the one hand, his work is very famous. He designed the clock tower that we all call Big Ben, even though that's not his proper name. He built the first cathedral in England since Christopher Wren's St. Paul's. He wrote the first ever architectural manifesto. On the other hand, he was for many years a surprisingly obscure figure, and that's really why I wanted to write his biography. And there were reasons for this. Pugin died young at the age of 40, before his work had really matured. John Ruskin disliked Pugin, and he disliked his work, and Ruskin outlived and outtalked Pugin by half a century. Pugin was a Catholic, and that in the 19th, and indeed sometimes still in the 20th century, counted against him. But the really big problem, which I discovered when I came to write God's Architect, was the lack of successful buildings. One has to be honest about this. Pugin's influence in his lifetime depended largely on what he wrote and what he represented. He was the first person to argue for architecture as a moral rather than a purely aesthetic practice. He addressed the problems of the expanding Victorian cities and he suggested that if they were unplanned and ugly and full of poverty and misery, then that was the fault of the society that had created them. But when it came to his own buildings, Pugin was often hampered. But he was hampered by lack of money, by difficulties with the church authorities, which we'll come to later. And it must be said by his own experience, 40 is very young for an architect. If Pugin had lived to be, say, 70, I think we would regard all the buildings we have by him as early work. Most of his buildings were not completed according to his intentions, um, or they were drastically altered after his death. There are just a few exceptions. Once or twice, there was enough money, there was a sufficiently sympathetic patron, and Pugin had the right skills and the right collaborators to do his best. And that, the Drum and Chantry at Albury, which we've just seen pictures of, I'm pleased to say, is one of those rare examples and the Church's Conservation Trust is very lucky to have it. It's a mortuary chapel created, now I'm going to have to move my, um, there we go, right. Um, that you see it again. Um, it was created by Pugin between 1843 and 1847 for Henry Drummond, and Henry Drummond was a partner in Drummond's bank. 
he lived at Albury Park and he had this place created as a burial place, a, a funerary chapel for his three sons, all of whom sadly died young. And the chapel was formed out of the south transept of the parish church of St. Peter and St. Paul, which as we heard is a building that's partly Saxon, partly Norman, partly medieval. It stands very close to the big house, Albury Park, and it's visible from the gates. And that fact was to have a considerable bearing on its fate. St. Peter and St. Paul has been since the Reformation, as you would expect, an Anglican place of worship. But neither Drummond nor Pugin was an Anglican. Pugin, as I've explained, was a Roman Catholic. Drummond belonged to a millenarian sect which styled itself the Catholic Apostolic Church. Its members confidently awaited Christ's imminent return, so confidently, in fact, that they have the ro they still have his robes already in Islington, where it was apparently ordained that Christ would first appear. Drummond and his fellow millenarians were popularly, or more often unpopularly, known as Irvingites after their founder, the Scottish minister Edward Irving. And Irving is the curious figure who unites Pugin and Drummond, and it is because of him that the chapel at Albury exists. Um, but before we come to that, I'm actually going to fill in some of the background for all three of these men, beginning with Pugin. Pugin was born in London in 1812. His mother, Catherine Welby, was an intellectual woman, an occasional journalist, a member of a junior branch of a landed Lincolnshire family, she was an Anglican by birth, but like a lot of her contemporaries, she was very intensely critical of the established church. Pugin's father, Auguste Charles, was French. He'd been baptized a Catholic, but he had no interest in religion of any stripe. He came to England during the French Revolution. He claimed to be Le Comte de Pugin. He was, in fact, a commercial artist in Paris, and he continued in the same line in London. And it was from Auguste that the young Pugin learned to draw. And at that time, you have to remember, there was no formal training system for architects. And the young Pugin learned about buildings by helping his father to produce books of measured details. This is a page from one of them of medieval buildings. And the reason that books like this, which were precisely measured and from which architects could copy, the reason they were in such demand is that Pugin was growing up with what came to be called the Gothic Revival, that turn in architecture from the classical to medieval models. And it was gathering pace all the time that Pugin was growing up. And he was extremely precocious, it must be said. He was 15 when his father got the job of designing some Gothic furniture for George IV at Windsor Castle. And Auguste very quickly handed the job over to his teenage son. So at 15, Pugin was working for the king. And he grew up into a clever, energetic, enthusiastic, and generally, it must be said, happy teenager. There was only one thing that blighted his life, and that was Edward Irving. As I say, Catherine, his mother, thought deeply about religious questions, and she was one of many people who had fallen under Irving's spell. Irving was a minister of the Church of Scotland and he sprang to fame in 1823 when Canning praised his preaching in the House of Commons. And soon great crowds were squashing themselves into this grim little brick chapel in Hatton Garden to hear these very dramatic sermons. And as you can see, it wasn't very popular. Um, this is the kind of um, pressure gauge on his pulpit. Gasometer exploded. Um, I can't quite read that one, puritanical. Hatton Garden is absolutely the kind of the, the top expression. Um, well, as I say, he was tall, handsome, dark eyed, had a very theatrical manner. He was also very intelligent. He was a friend of Coleridge. He was a friend of the Carlyles and he preached very powerfully for hour after hour. So Catherine dragged her reluctant son there every Sunday and Pugin was bored to distraction fidgeting in this very ugly little conventicle. And his friend, Benjamin Ferry, who wrote the first biography of Pugin and who regretted his friend's conversion to Catholicism, Ferry implied that it was the sheer boredom of Irving's sermons that drove him into the arms of Rome. Well, of course it didn't, but it did certainly prejudice him against the low church. Meanwhile, when he wasn't wedged into the chapel in Hatton Garden, the teenage Pugin was busy. 
He embarked on a series of adolescent adventures. He worked at Covent Garden as a set designer. He started his own furniture business. He bought a boat. He began a lifelong career as a very skillful sailor. And he got married without his parents' knowledge to the niece of a Covent Garden stagehand when he was under age and she was four months pregnant. He was talented, but he was directionless. He was energetic, he was spoiled, he was inexperienced, and he was riding for a fall, and soon enough it came. His furniture business went broke. He had no idea how to run a business. His boat was blown off course in a storm and he was nearly drowned. And worst of all, his wife, Anne Garnet, died a few days after their child, another Anne, was born. And what you see here very poignantly is the death mask that he had made um, and a cast of her hand. So by the time Pugin was 21, he had been shipwrecked, bankrupted and widowed. And within a year of Anne's death, both his parents died and the household, he was never sent away to school. This was his only home, his only school, his entire world was broken up. And it was a shock from which he never recovered. And it changed the course, not just of his life, but the whole of the Gothic revival. By the 1830s, when Pugin was suddenly left in this awful way to begin the world again, the mood of England had changed and it had darkened much as his own life had darkened. There was a millenarian spirit abroad. At any given time, of course, there are a few people who think that the end of the world is nigh, but this was a moment when a lot of people, including educated, fairly rational people like John Henry Newman and Thomas Arnold, the, form, the reforming headmaster of rugby, believed that the apocalypse at hand, was at hand. And so increasingly did Edward Irving. Like them, he began to believe that the French Revolution had marked the beginning of the end times, which would culminate in the second coming in Islington. Um, and Irving's preaching got longer and longer and more and more peculiar. And as he despaired of returning Britain to his own idea of true Christianity, he turned increasingly to prophecy people at his services started to speak in tongues. And it was now that his path crossed that of Henry Drummond. Drummond also was one of these um, wealthy, well-placed people who believed in the coming of the latter days at this point. And he organized a series of meetings at his home, Albury Park. At these advent conferences, as they became known, because it was, they, they believed that they were in a period that one could describe as an advent um, on the brink of a second coming. Drummond, Irving and others, most of them wealthy, well-placed men, studied the books of prophecy and waited for the apocalypse. The Church of Scotland, which had got increasingly windy about Irving and his behavior, and was aghast at the speaking in tongues, because it was absolutely not part of their way of going about things, they expelled him. And so out of Albury and the conferences, a new church was born, the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church, as it called and calls itself, in which Drummond held the rank of apostle, evangelist and prophet. Irving himself was becoming an increasingly troubled figure, physically and mentally fragile. He showed signs of consumption and of depression and in 1834, he died. It's really, in some ways, it's a ludicrous story, but it's also a very sad story. But after Irving's death, Henry Drummond, who was his follower as well as his patron, moved swiftly to take control of the whole movement. And he took it in a very different direction from the low church evangelical origins from which it had sprung. Well, the 1830s saw the worst civil unrest in English history, and this went very much with the millenarian mood. There were riots in Bristol, where they burnt down the Bishop's Palace, and in Nottingham, where they burnt down the castle. And all around Drummond's home at Albury Park, where the, the so-called swing riots were taking place, named for the elusive folk hero who may or may not have been a person, Captain Swing, and there were great outbreaks of rick burning. It was said that if you stood on Hampstead Heath, you could see London ringed by fire. Britain had its first cholera epidemic. And in October 1834, it seemed like yet another sign of the times when the Palace of Westminster caught fire and everybody went to watch. The Thames was solid with boats. Turner painted the scene, Constable drew it. Irving's friend Thomas Carlyle was there in the crowd. And so as it happened was Pugin. 
The old palace, the medieval palace, had become a kind of ant heap of unplanned accretions around the medieval core. And it symbolized to Pugin something rotten, both in architecture and in England. And he noticed that among the flames, that, and actually that's what you can see in this rather naive drawing, but you see that the um, medieval fabric has survived and all the later additions by people like Wyatt and Soane, the cement and the stucco had blown and cracked. And of course it was in Pugin's own experience too, that the architecture of the Middle Ages, that was what had survived the wreckage of his life, that was the one love that had not failed him. And so like Irving and like Drummond, he saw a divine message in troubled times. But in his case, what he saw was the Gothic architecture of the Middle Ages as a kind of divine revealed truth, what Coleridge called a living symbol. And he came to believe that the medieval world, which was godly, coherent, secure, like his own childhood, had been smashed apart at the Reformation. And the modern world, which was sinful, chaotic, full of grief and uncertainty was the result. And Pugin wanted to go back to regain that certainty, to reverse the Reformation. And in some ways, intellectually, he was quite literal minded. And in 1835, he became a Roman Catholic. And in 1836, he published Contrasts, which was, as I have said earlier, the first architectural manifesto. Contrasts shows the modern city as immoral, hideous, a place of stucco fronted architecture, for a society with stucco fronted principles. And it compares it building type by building type with the Middle Ages. And Pugin also used the figures in his um, plates to tell the story. And you can see here with the contrasted pumps, this is the medieval pump, this is the modern one. The point is partly the architecture, but also the child, the pump is chained up and the child is chased away by the beadle and not allowed to have its free drink. Um, and this reminds us, I think, that Contrast was published the year before Oliver Twist. The problem of the city, the problem of people living together in greater numbers than ever before in history. This was going to be one of the great themes of the Victorian age. And at the same time, of course, Contrast is funny. It's quite witty. This is Pugin's attack on modern architecture as just a trade. And he set them all up in a shop window. Um, and there's a glazing bar going straight through John Nash's nose. And Nash, of course, the preeminent architect of the day, um, was rather cheeky. And also contrasts like um, Irving, like Drummond, it sounds a note of millennial warning. On the last page, which is what you can see here, Pugin showed the architecture of the late Georgians. Here they're all named. Um, balancing against the architecture of the Middle Ages, pivoting veritas, pivoting on the eye of truth and around the edge is written, they are weighed in the balance and found wanting, which is the writing on the wall from Belshazzar's feast. And so we see by different routes, Pugin and Drummond are beginning to converge. Well, this first architectural manifesto made Pugin's name. The combination of satire and polemic caught the public mood. We were just on the eve of Victorian age and you can see this new Victorian um, moral certainty beginning to emerge. And it also was helped it, it, with Pugin's reputation because it coincided with the greatest public debate about architecture that England had ever known. And this came about because of the competition to rebuild the Palace of Westminster. Charles Barry had been in Brighton when the fire broke out and when he was coming back, he saw the blaze on the horizon and asked what it was. And he's supposed to have answered, what a chance for an architect. But he was a classical architect and the new palace was to be in the increasingly popular Gothic style. Barry knew that Pugin was an expert in Gothic detail. He got Pugin to help him with the drawings for his competition entry and those exquisitely detailed drawings undoubtedly helped Barry to win. Meanwhile, Pugin became famous in his own right, thanks, thanks to contrasts, although like many famous architects then and indeed now, he hadn't actually built anything. But he did plunge into a frenetically um, busy career. Between 1838 and 1841, so before he was 30, Pugin built or had in progress 22 churches, three cathedrals, three convents, several schools and a monastery. Pugin's first churches, like St. Mary's Derby, which you can see here, and St. Albans Macclesfield, which you'll see in a minute, 
were based on the late Gothic architecture that he had seen in Germany. And there's still a whiff of the Georgian about these buildings. They're very fine boned, they're very symmetrical. And if you compare St. Mary's Derby with um, St. George's Everton, which you can see on the right, which was designed in the year that Pugin was born, you can see they're not so very different in some of their aesthetic. Where Pugin was innovative was in the arrangement of his church on ecclesiological principles. And what that meant was that his churches were arranged like medieval churches. The focus was not on the pulpit, the Protestant gospel of the word and all that intensely boring preaching that he'd had to go through, but on the altar, on the mystery of the sacraments. And this return to the liturgical arrangements of the Middle Ages made a church a symbolic building in which Christ's death and resurrection was enacted in the mass. And you can see a bit more what I mean. Here's St. Albans Macclesfield. Pugin always wanted a rude screen in his churches. The crucifixion raised high in the chancel arch, which marks the division between the nave and the sanctuary. Christ's death symbolizing the transition from the secular to the sacred, from this world to the world of the spirit. Pugin's first cathedral was St. Chad's Birmingham, and as I said, England's first cathedral since St. Paul's. And like the other early churches in Pugin's of, it was built in a Germanic style uh, of late Gothic in red brick, rising up sheer. You can see on the left how it looked when it was built, rising up out of this very squalid part of the city. And as you see it now, rising up over the ring road, neither setting perhaps ideal. And also, of course, extraordinary to bring Romantic Catholicism to the heart of Birmingham, an industrial city, a, a hotbed of radicalism. Um, inevitably, from the technical point of view, these churches, these early churches were to a great extent experiments because as I've explained, Fujian had no formal architectural training and there was a lot of trial and error in them. At St Anne's Keithley, a church I'm not going to show you because it's been so messed about, Pugin wrote tersely in his diary, Belfry fell down. Well, it was about 1841 um, that Pugin's ideas began to focus and his technical skills began to catch up with what he wanted to do. Stylistically, his big decision was to purge his work of foreign influences. English Gothic, he decided, was what you should build in England, and middle pointed, as it was called then, that is the late 13th, early 14th century, that was the best and the purest style. And from now on, there would be no more perpendicular, no more late Gothic, no more foreign Gothic in his work, at least for a while. Pugin changed his mind often. But Pugin's ideal church did not stand alone. The church, as he'd shown in contrast, the Gothic was for all of society. And around the church, picturesquely grouped, would be the clergy house, the school, the almshouses, the cottages. And all the time, he was pushing the boundaries of Gothic into new building types. And this school at Spetchley in Worcestershire, when you, which is a school and a schoolmaster's house, when you look at it, you think, oh, yes, well, that's a very charming Victorian school and quite typical in its way, but of course there hadn't been anything like it before. Pugin invented this form, which we do now happily take for granted. The culmination of this first part of Pugin's career was the Church of St Giles Cheadle in Staffordshire, which opened in 1846. It is the essential English parish church, though not as there was never anything like this in the Middle Ages, um, it is an ideal, transfigured, it's a full-blown, high romantic work of art. And every detail of the glass, the tiles, the metalwork, the wall painting, it's all part of a single artistic conception. And it was this idea, the conception of the architect as a designer in all media, creator of the Gesamtkunstwerk, that went straight into the bloodstream of the rising generation of Victorian church architects. Men like G.G. Scott, William Butterfield, G.E. Street, all the great high Victorians just imbibed this from Pugin. And around St. Giles, as you'll know if you've ever been, there's a convent, school, clergy house, all set within the town. And then not far away up at Alton, Pugin created around the site of the medieval castle, another complex of buildings, which was intended to embody the entire cycle of Christian life. This is St. John's Hospital. Pugin using the word hospital in the medieval sense as a place um, that offered every kind of, of 
shelter or charity. There's a school, there's a church, an old people's home. And opposite this little settlement um, across the valley was the great medieval castle, which was rebuilt by Pugin um, to dominate the Chernet Valley. And all this um, was um, under the patronage of the Earl of Shrewsbury, Pugin's great patron. Um, and it represented their romantic Tory ideal of society as hierarchical. Um, you pay respect to the person who is above you, but also crucially, you have a duty of care to those who are below you. In 1841, just as it was all coming into focus in his mind, Pugin published his second important book, True Principles of Pointed or Christian Architecture. And it was important because it went beyond architecture. Pugin never doubted, as we saw at Cheadle, that to revive Gothic architecture meant you had to revive all the applied arts. You couldn't have one style in the library and another in the drawing room. That same thread of truth, reality, must run through every artifact and every medium, from a thurible to a castle, from a tea caddy to a cathedral. And Pugin wasn't only writing about the applied arts in True Principles, he was, as we saw at St Giles, a brilliant designer in many media. Pugin had an extraordinary Mozartian ability to spin pattern after pattern out of an apparently small number of motifs. He designed carpets and wallpaper. With his friend, John Hardman, the Birmingham metal worker, he established a regular catalogue of metalwork, domestic and ecclesiastical. He was the first architect whose work you could order from a catalogue and get through the post. And also, if you ordered a table, it would come flat packed um, and could be assembled much more easily than the average IKEA bookcase. I've seen it done. Um, and with Herbert Minton, the great entrepreneurial potter at Stafford, he developed a range of encaustic tiles for flooring. Pugin never managed to get stained glass as good as he really wanted it, even after 1845, when he and Hardman, <coughs> excuse me, set up their own works. But it was the experiments of these years made by Pugin Hardman and a handful of others that improved the quality of stained glass and made what William Morris and Morris and Co did in the next generation possible. Pugin also designed clothes, he designed vestments, and he also designed clothes for his second wife, Louisa. He loved drapery. Um, he appreciated the way that draped figures moved through three dimensional space. And that was something he had learned in the theater. To wear Gothic clothes, literally to inhabit his vision was to him a logical extension of it. And you can see him here on the Albert Memorial depicted um, wearing, his, um, wearing his smock. In 1843, he published his glossary of ornament which was a triumphant display of his genius in pattern design. And then the next year, and bear in mind, Pugin is still only 32, there came another turning point in his life. And this was the beginning of a decline as steep as the rise that began in 1836. In August of that year, his second wife, Louisa, whom he had married soon after Anne Garnet's death, died suddenly, leaving him now with six children and the youngest only a few months old. It was another shattering loss and it undermined Pugin's mental and physical health. And it also coincided with an appeal from Charles Barry to come back and work at the Palace of Westminster. Barry was in a fix as he himself admitted because he got the shell of the Palace of Westminster up after a lot of difficulty, but he had to design the furnishing and the fittings. And although the Gothic revival through these years had progressed very rapidly in architecture, so much so that in fact Barry's building looked to the well-informed architectural critic rather out of date by the time it appeared. But nobody apart from Pugin had been working in the decorative arts in the same coherent way. So Pugin wasn't just the best person to design the interiors of the Palace of Westminster, he was the only person who could possibly have done it. And he was appealed to by Barry in a weak moment and agreed to do it. So he made designs for everything. You can see all the fittings of the House of Lords. The work was intense. When Pugin took it on, because he worked so fast, I don't think he realized what it would be like if you're working for somebody else who wants constant revisions. It was very badly paid. And for the rest of his life, Pugin was tied to the treadmill of the palace. 
And at the same time, he was getting fewer architectural commissions because his huge influence had worked in some ways against him. There were several architects now who frankly copied Pugin, and many of them were cheaper and all of them were more easygoing. And then there was this problem, which I touched on before, as I didn't introduce it as a problem, but it became a problem about the arrangement of his churches with their commitment to the medieval plan, the rude screen, the division of the chancel and the nave, the, the focus on the sacramental. The Roman Catholic Church now looked, of course, ever more towards Rome and less towards its English past. Church architecture on the continent had changed as time had gone by. There were Baroque churches, classical churches. It was only in England and Scotland where Catholicism had stopped with the Reformation that it could seem that there was any necessary connection between the Gothic and the Catholic. The Church of Rome wanted buildings that were light and bright. They wanted the congregation to be able to see the altar. And they didn't want what Pugin was doing. But while he was isolated among his fellow Catholics, his views on architecture were shared very much by high church Anglicans, the Tractarians, the members of the Ecclesiological Society, and they were the people who often gave him work, and they were personally on very good terms with him. But another thing that the ecclesiologists in Pugin had in common was that they were rather disconcerted to discover that they had allies, whether they liked it or not, among the Irvinger. Because by the 1840s, with Irving dead and the Catholic Apostolic Church entirely dominated by Henry Drummond, Drummond too believed in the sacred symbolism of Gothic architecture and the medieval plan. Um, and of course, while he and his um, co-religionists were waiting for the apocalypse, they needed churches. And so we return to Surrey. The Church of St. Peter and St. Paul stood, as I mentioned, close to the gates of Albury Park. It was a parish church with, as is usual with parish church, had a village around it. Drummond didn't like the village and he didn't like the villages either, especially not after all the rioting in Rickburn. Like Pugin and the Gothic revivalists, he believed in a hierarchical society in which he was at the top and in which the poor should be well provided for materially, but should do as they were told and certainly not be given the vote. So he proceeded to have the village moved to the Western Street end of the parish, where he told the villagers that he would build them a new church. This is extremely unpopular. Many villagers protested that they didn't want to move and they didn't want a new church. They and their ancestors had attended the little Saxon church for centuries. Their family's graves were there. And one of the locals was a, a very popular um, journalist, Martin Tupper, who started a big public campaign and demanded that he should have the right to be buried at St. Peter and St. Paul. And Drummond wrote back rather rudely that as far as he was concerned, Tupper could be buried as soon as he liked. Well, the new church at Western Street, which was also dedicated to St. Peter and St. Paul, was a bit of a disaster. Um, it's better now than it was because it had um, Blumfield made some additions to it. But it is, as Pevsner puts it tactfully, an odd building for the 1840s. It was designed by Mackintosh Brooks, who was a competent, if not a very stellar Victorian architect. This is the beginning of the 1840s. Um, and it's in a Romanesque style, which was what um, Drummond had asked for. And it's built in a rather grim kind of brick. And that was very much not what Drummond had asked for. Drummond intended it to be a stone building. And he left instructions that it should be a stone building before he went off traveling for some months. And I think we've all had that experience when you leave instructions for a builder and you go away and when you come back, they haven't done what you wanted, but very few people can have had that experience on such a massive scale. And one can only imagine what Drummond, who as I say was notoriously bad tempered, said to Mackintosh Brooks when he got back. Um, Drummond himself, of course, didn't worship there. He had also, by Mackintosh Brooks, built another Irvingite church nearby. And this is the, on what you see on the right is a very rare archive photograph of the interior, because although the church is still very well cared for, it's very difficult of access. Um, the church is in the perpendicular style with a polygonal chapter house. Um, and it's not what Eugen would have regarded as correct but it has a great imposing dignity. And I think the chapter house is actually very beautiful. Drum Drummond 
as I said, he chose the Romanesque, the very early Gothic for the parish church, because he wanted to make it clear that the parishioners, the village people, were in a very early state of enlightenment. They had a very long way to go. This later perpendicular Gothic reflects his belief that they, the Irvingites, the Catholic apostolics, had a much more mature understanding of revelation and they stood on the brink of apocalypse. The apostolics had no succession plan. They obviously didn't need one because um, the world was going to end anyway, but there are surviving members of the Catholic Apostolic Church and they have kept this building in very good order. So it was that by the mid 1840s, Henry Drummond had a place to worship for himself, a place where he could shove the parishioners reluctantly and a very clear view from his gates unobstructed by the homes of the lower orders. And of course, this explains why, as we heard earlier, various bits and pieces from the Saxon church uh, were removed because the villagers felt that they were theirs and they wanted them um, with them. The Saxon church was in a bad state of repair. This has been photographed through glass, so I'm sorry about the reflection, but as you can see, it is um, covered in ivy and not in a good way. Drummond wanted to create within it a burial place for his sons, all three of whom predeceased him. The third died in 1844, and that was the year that he approached Pugin. That he should have wanted to employ Pugin to do it is not surprising. Pugin was by now one of the most preeminent architects of the age, very famous, if increasingly underemployed. What is perhaps more puzzling is that Pugin, whose childhood had been blighted by Irving, and had no time for the Irvingites, who he thought of as a deluded sect, should have taken the job of creating this jewel-like um, chapel. Well, there were a number of reasons. First of all, he needed the work, and when you uh, try and study an architect's career, you should never underestimate pragmatism. Secondly, this kind of small building within a building, an edicule, was something he, was, he always loved, and he was terribly good at it. And he had by now, as we saw at the Palace of Westminster, a team of painters and stained glass designers who could do what he wanted. But lastly, and perhaps most surprisingly, Pugin, for whom personal relations were always important, actually liked Henry Drummond. Theirs was a meeting of strong minds and fierce opinions, but it was characterized by mutual respect. They argued about everything, but they argued as equals. In 1845, Pugin wrote to Drummond in a tone that sums up their relationship. You always give me a parting shot. You're a slippery antagonist. I won't say any more, it's no use. Vous êtes un homme inconcevable. But I will do my best to get the right thing for you, even at the risk of being scolded when I've done. Pugin also worked for Drummond on the house, but that was not a success. It was in the little church that the masterpiece was realized. Pugin began by raising the roof of the transept, and replacing the south window in which he reproduced the fat quatrefoil. You'll see it better in the next slide, but this, which is very unusual. Um, and he reconstructed it. It became a favorite motif in his own work around this time. He loved this, um, this tracery. His decorations for the chapel incorporated devices and mottos from the family arms, as well as those of the Hay family, the Earls of Kintool, which was the family of Henry Drummond's wife, Harriet. And the wavy lines of the Drummond arms create an effect like textile, as if the interior was tented. And that I think adds greatly to its richness. Pugin had a much freer hand here than Charles Barry let him have in the Palace of Westminster, where he was working on the House of Lords at the same time. And I think you can see the affinities between the two, despite the difference in scale. The glass was by William Wales, the brass is by Pugin's friend and collaborator Hardman, the tiles by Minton. But the interesting thing to me, particularly about the iconography of the Drummond Chapel, is that it presents, as we might expect, something of a theological curiosity. In it, we see Catholic and millenarian beliefs set in an Anglican context. Pugin wanted to include King Malcolm and King Arthur, who were the namesakes of Drummond's two elder sons, but Drummond thought that was too secular, almost blasphemous, and they settled instead for St Andrew and St John um, in reference to the Drummond Scottish heritage and their association with the Abbey of Inchaffray. 
It's the figure in the large south window, however, that's the most interesting, because as far as Pugin was concerned, this was the virgin and child. Though why you would have the virgin and child in a church that is not dedicated to St. Mary, in a chapel that is not a lady chapel, is not clear. To Drummond, the figure was emblematic of the church triumphant, an archetypal female figure with, as he put it, the man-child crowned. And there they left it. But Pugin was pleased with his work. He loved the little Saxon church and its unusual quatrefoils, which he took into his own most personal creation. This is his church at Ramsgate, and there you see it. And that uh, window is in his own mortuary chapel at St Augustine's. And there he was buried at the age of only 40 in 1852. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. That was fascinating. There's been some really lovely, lovely comments coming through and some great questions already. So everyone, now is the time for um, your questions. So if you've got any questions that you'd like us to put to Dr. Rosemary Hill, please do comment away. As I said, if you're watching this on Catch Up, if you still have questions, please comment away and um, we'll try and get answers for you. Um, before we go in, everyone, though, I'm just reminded that um, to coincide with today's lecture, we are selling um, uh, uh, Rosemary's first book. Um, so this is God's Architect Pugin and the Building of Romantic Britain. Um, that came out a few years ago, but it really is a seminal piece of work and there's some fantastic reviews, but I didn't, I was going through it again earlier and it's got some really, so some of the slides you've seen today about some of the, um, I think that was St. Chad's in Birmingham, um, some of the images that there's really great images in here as well. Then um, we've also got Rosemary's brand new book, Times Witness, History in the Age of Romanticism, as Russ said earlier, this only um, had its official launch this week. We're selling these at a special bundle um, price. I think if you bought both of them together, it was about um, $45.99, but we're selling both of those together um, for $33.99 plus postage and packaging. Um, but you can also buy them singly from us at a discounted price also. Um, Rosemary, I'm going to jump in with the first question then we've had, and it's about this book. Um, someone said, could you tell us a little bit about what this is, book is about? Yes, I certainly can. It's, it's got some um, Pugin content as well. It's really about a, a last generation of historians who were the antiquaries. And it's about the way in which history between 1789 and 1851, so between the French Revolution and the Great Exhibition, how history changed. And what happened was that the partly, not entirely because of the French Revolution, but the French Revolution delivered the most enormous shock to the whole of Europe. And the Enlightenment idea of what history was for, which was to demonstrate the forward march of progress, to take no interest in the Middle Ages at all. You look to Greece, you look to Rome, you look for models, and every day in every way, civilization got better and better and better. Well, the revolution suggested that that was not necessarily the case. And the antiquaries who were interested in local history, in medieval history, in the history of clothes and food and fashion, in the history of ordinary people, suddenly um, they found that everyone was interested in their stuff. The Wordsworth and the romantic poets were interested in it. And it began to be the case that you could be a historian without being a gentleman. You didn't actually have to be a man at all suddenly, very revolutionary. Um, and you could be interested in any subject and you could be interested in not only written subjects, but in buildings, in clothes in the remain the material remains of the past and that's what antiquaries had always been interested in but in the 18th century that interest floated out to the cultural margins with the revolution it comes storming back and that's really what the gothic revival was about in architecture but it went through the whole of society thank you so much rosemary so i hope that answers um, your question there um to the person who asked that about the book um as I said um you can buy both of those in a bundle or um separately i should say we've only got a limited number in stock of the bundles though so um i think we've got um 20 um bundle offers available so um, if you'd like to get a copy um do um get in quickly um so um some of the other questions that are coming are the irving knights still a denomination and do they have um churches still used for worship well, they certainly, because they don't like to be called the Irvingites, um, Catholic Apostolic Church, um, there are still members of it. It is many years now since I went to see the church at Albury, but um, having got in touch with them, uh, they were kind enough to allow me to go in. 
And I must say, it's very well looked after. It was warm and dry and all those things that one worries about with churches that aren't used. Um, and there is still um, church in London. Christ's robes are still there, as far as I know. And other churches have been other. Um, there's one very near where I live in um, Camberwell, which has now been is now um, a Greek Orthodox church. So many of the buildings, I think, were, were sold or, or transferred to other denominations. And one of the things, although Irving himself was a bit of a kind of swivel eyed um, extremist, the, um, the, the doctrine of the Catholic apostolics was always that if they didn't have a church near them of their own denomination, you would just go to the nearest church. You were part of a bigger Christian ideal. And I think, as I say, in so far as I've dealt with them, they are very um, much like that. Thank you, Rosemary. And earlier on in your lecture, you talked about, um, you showed that the, those beautiful slides from Cujan's Contrast, and you had those water pumps, and you made reference that this was published before um, some of Charles, uh, I think it was Oliver Twist you mentioned before, um, Dickens published it. And someone's asked a question about Pugin and Dickens. Um, do you know much um, about if Pugin and Dickens had contact with one another, uh, especially in Salisbury? Um, I don't believe they had any contact in Salisbury. Um, they certainly, they were born in the same year. They had friends in common, Clarkson Stanfield for one, Charles Matthews for another. Pugin read Dickens um, and very much enjoyed it, but I don't think he thought about Dickens personally because Pugin wasn't really like that. Dickens, I'm quite sure, thought about Pugin. And certainly if, you, if by Salisbury, you mean uh, Mr. Pecksniff, first and nastiest architect in English fiction. Um, I'm quite sure that something of Pugin's father's drawing school lay behind that um, Mr. Pecksniff making all his pupils draw the cathedral from, from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, um, and then taking credit for all their work. I don't think people argue about whether Pecksniff is a thief. Well, of course not. I mean, Dickens was a novelist. He was a genius at inventing things, but he also picked um, bits and pieces from from everything he heard, and I'm sure from both Charles Matthews, who was actually a pupil of Pugin's father, in particular. Um, yes, he had that idea in mind. So I think there's some of Pugin in Dickens, but very little of Dickens in Pugin. Thanks, Rosemary. And um, one and an interesting question here is that um, Pugin did a study for Freemasons Hall in London, but they didn't use his design. Do you know why this was the case? And was Pugin a Freemason himself? Pugin most certainly was not a Freemason. Um, I didn't know that he did a study for Freemasons Hall. That's interesting. And uh, that's interesting there, but um, someone said, um, are, are they correct in thinking that Pugin lived in the Grange next to St Augustine's in Ramsgate? Yes. Yes, where I showed you the church at the end, his house is, you know, if it was a wider shot, you would see his house just next to it. And um, I know you earlier on, Rosemary, you mentioned about especially um, the, the, the house um, for the schoolmaster there. If anyone wants to go and visit that, do also make sure that you visit our church at Spetchley, which is a fantastic little church. But um, it, you go inside, and it's got some fantastic memorials, but the stained glass um, is quite controversial because it shows people holding rosaries. Um, it was a recusant family chapel, um, but it's lovingly cared for and it's still on the estate. Great tea room by there as well. So if you go and see um, Pugin's work in Spetchley, do go and see our church there also. Um, St. Peter and Paul um, Albury has a cupola on the top of the tower which doesn't seem to be very Pugin. Is this later edition? It was an earlier edition, if you see what I mean. Um, and I think, um, I think Pugin would have got rid of that and built a spire if he'd been allowed to, and I think we can all be rather pleased that he wasn't. So that, um, as I think we heard at the beginning, I mean that there would have been a bigger tower or a spire. I think probably a spire, but anyway, that had long gone as they tend to. And somebody in the intervening period, possibly just earlier in the 19th century had put that little cupola on. And um, I'm so glad it survived. And everyone, if you'd like to learn more about St. Peter's Albury, we'll post a link to the church page on our website. Um, there's some free guides on there, so you can download some really interesting guides about the church. But the tower is fantastic. And from the exterior, you can see just how, that Saxon stages of, you know, how it's developed. As we said at the site, it was originally the chancel for the Saxon church at the end of the nave before a, a, a later edition of chancel was put on and the tower was extended. Um, do we know what's happened to Pugin's first six children? 
Yes, um, uh, one of the, he had so many um, sad bereavements in his life, but very luckily, um, none of his, all his children survived um, to adulthood. And there are at the present rate, I think something like 121 living descendants and a very um, elaborate family tree. Um, Peter Paul and Cuthbert, his um, younger, younger sons, became and uh, became architects and went into partnership with uh, Pugin and Pugin. Um, his eldest son, Edward, um, who was his second child, um, also had a career as an architect. And if you go to the Pugin Society website, you will find that recently um, a complete gazetteer of E.W. Pugin's work has been um, produced. And there's, um, I think that the CCT's got, got an E.W. Pugin church, haven't you? We have. So E.W. Pugin, the only complete Anglican church that um, he designed um, is in our care. And that's St. Catherine's Church at Kingsdown in Kent, um, which got this massive uh, needle-like spire and some really interesting carvings at the church. But yes, it's the only complete Anglican church he designed and it's in our care these days. So yes, um, but do recommend going to have a look at some of his work. Um, Rosemary, I'm just trying to plan through some of the other questions that are coming in. Um, you showed at the start how Pugin showed um, a certain Germanic Gothic, um, particularly at St. Chad's. Had he gone over and done sort of a tour of Europe and sort of collect these ideas and brought them back from almost like a grand tour? Yes, well, very much not like, not like a grand tour in the sense that it was not classical and also that it was not, um, I mean, he traveled very rough as his third wife discovered when she went traveling with him. It was kind of once and never again. Um, but yes, he did. He traveled a lot in France, of course, because he was half French and he traveled with his parents in France. And they, the family had planned a German tour and for various reasons, I won't bother you with, it didn't happen. Then his parents died and he immediately struck out for Germany. And there, was, there were numbers and numbers of sketchbooks. And he just went over because what he discovered to his joy in Germany was that the Lutheran Reformation, they didn't, there was no iconoclasm. They didn't smash up all the altars and all the statues. So he was actually seeing um, what a medieval church looked like with all its fittings, all intact. And that was incredibly exciting. Thanks, Rosa. And um, do you have any comments on how St. Mary's Cathedral in Newcastle came about, the process and history behind its commissioning and the building and quality of work compared to Pugin's other works? Well, that's a big question. Um, yes, I mean, I didn't, um, you've plugged my book so successfully, I hardly need to say, but I mean, there is much more about that there. It was a very, if, if the implication of the question is that it's not that good, um, certainly it was not a happy commission. And Pugin and George Myers, his builder, um, Pugin said at one, it was a committee. Pugin was hopeless with committees. Um, and they, they kept wanting him to kind of, as it were, fill in forms. And he couldn't do any of that. And he said he was all ordered in and out like a port contractor at a workhouse. And there were terrible rows. Um, and I think that is, as I say, if you look in my book, I will cover that. Um, but it's not a particularly successful building, no. I suppose going from, um, a, you know, a not particularly successful building, do you have a particular um, Pugin commission that you, you know, it's a favourite for you and there's a particular reason why it is? Well, it, I mean, the two favourites are the Royal Chantry in Devon and the Drummond Chapel, because you can just see, you know that you are seeing what he wanted to do. This was what was in his mind and it actually happened. Whereas almost everywhere else, you have to kind of shut one eye and cast your mind back and look at the drawings and so on. Um, and no, I, I absolutely love the Drummond Chapel. And also I have to say the Royal Chantry, which is similarly built within the remains of a medieval church. Um, and its setting is very beautiful, but there's something about the Saxon church and the Drummond Chantry that is just magical. I think final question to um, end on is that uh, you, you talked about um, when Pugin came about and his designs, there was a lot of talk about churches and particularly about uh, the, some of the biggest architectural discussions um, our nation's ever had. What do you think Pugin would think about um, churches today and the discussions going about their future uses and, uh, you know, as new churches are built? I think, well, I mean, of course, the row about rude streams um, still goes on the row about how much the congregation should be part of the worship um, and how much 
they should be um there should be a sense of something sacred and sacramental that happens beyond um the experience of the direct experience of the congregation that all still goes on oh i think he would just be um as he was in his lifetime he would have great friends great allies great rows um and he was very rarely ambivalent about anything Thank you so much, Rosemary, and everyone, thank you so much for your questions. If you've got more, please keep them coming. As I said, we'll do our best to get you answers. Um, we'll post a link also to Rosemary's books if you'd like to get those. Um, as we said at the start of this lecture, um, these lectures are always free of charge. Um, we've recorded all of them and you can watch them for free on our Facebook or on our YouTube channels. Um, so if you haven't, if this is the first time joining, there are um, over a year's worth of lectures now for you to um, watch and binge on. Um, but if you have enjoyed this, please do consider becoming a member of the Church's Conservation Trust. Um, your subscriptions help us to um, support and care for historic churches. We have 356 churches in our care at the moment, and that number is going to rise. Um, but if you join us um, and use the off-code lecture when you join us direct debit, um, as I said, £3.50 a month, you'll be sent a free copy of this book, which is The Secret Language of Churches and Cathedrals, written by one of our lecturers, Dr. Richard Stemp. And it's a great book. It's got some great details, which tells you how to read a church and specific features in the church. Um, Dr. Richard Stemp is coming back later on this year to do another lecture for us as well. Um, but everyone, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rosemary, for taking the time um, to give this free lecture for us. But if anyone's got any questions, any suggestions for future topics, let us know. Um, next week, we're going to be looking at, let me get the right um, title for you here. Um, we're gonna be looking at um, some really interesting stained glass. Um, so as you know, last week, we started the first of our series of lectures looking at the Oxford movement, the Gothic revival in England. Um, and so we looked at the beginnings of the Tractarian movement last week, we looked at um, Pugin today. Well, next week, we're gonna be looking at Aspying Heaven, the high Anglican aesthetic of Charles Ian McKemp, um, which is gonna be a really interesting lecture with some beautiful slides looking at stained glass. And that's by Adrian Barlow, who's written a fantastic book on that topic. So we look forward to seeing you next Thursday from 12.50 p.m. UK time. Um, but thank you ever so much, everyone. And once again, thank you, Rosemary. <laughs>